So, just a little bit of a review of the stuff that we've been talking about. Um, first off, we were talking about the way that discipleship is synonymous with, with Christianity. You really can't have one without the other. Um, because discipleship is about growth. It's about submitting our lives to God. Um, <coughs> apart from which, you know, obviously, when you first get saved, you know, you experience new things and everything, you're really excited, but there isn't much in way of um, spiritual produce in your life. There's not really... Um, be- uh, victories yet. There's kind of just the excitement of something new. Um, but then as you grow and as you um, as you pray and as you seek and everything, y- you you kind of, um, you know, you're changed. And um, that makes us into a disciple. Um, also, discipleship affects our relationship with God and people. Uh, Serena brought that up. Um, really a great point. Uh, I think it was the first or second week that we started the series. Um, and that's really kind of the core of discipleship. A lot of times people um, who have been saved over 30 years will kind of get this hard-hearted mentality to other people where they just kind of think that they are um, spiritually superior or uh, spiritually elite. Um, and I, w- I would strongly warn that when we get to that point, it shows that we might not be Christ's disciple anymore. Or we might start being our disciple at that point because discipleship is about um, relationship with not just God. That's great if, if you think that you're so so uh, spiritually mature, but what does Paul say? He says, for those of you who, who think that you are spiritually mature, make sure to restore people in a spirit of gentleness. See you know what I mean? He doesn't say, if you think that you're spiritually mature, hey, good for you. You've got one up on everybody else. He says, if you think that you're so mature, you should be in the process of serving other people. So, um, that those time, two definitely go hand in hand. Um, you can't really love God if you don't love people, and you can't love people, you can't say that you love um, God if you are not really showing love to people. I hope I said that right. Um, and then we talked about the three dilemmas that we're going to start looking at probably next month. Um, money, sex, and power. How to combat them, how to deal with them, whether how to deal with the good and bad of them, because as we talked about before, none of those things are evil. Money is not evil, sex is not evil, and power is not, power is not evil. These things are oftentimes used for evil but they themselves are not evil. So we're going to look at how to, um, how to correctly handle those things and how it applies to being a disciple of Christ. Um, and we talked about, with, about the way that discipleship is, is a high, has a high cost to it. Um, it's something that um, Jesus even warned about, don't just, don't just do this, you need to, you need to think about it uh, before you make a commitment. Um, and he gave, the, he gave the story about if a king goes to, to battle with someone, he, he makes sure that he has enough troops. Uh, before he goes and causes a uh, um, shame to himself, um, and we talked about mercy and justice being united. How God is both merciful and just. How, uh, the different ways that we, as Christians and as society, is supposed to deal with mercy and justice. Um, and we talked about the way that both both are, uh, are necessary. Uh, going back to this, just want to want to mention again about the way that, um, as a pastor, for instance, you have to show mercy to people, and you, yeah, and you have to be patient. But at the same time, you you can't drag your feet in doing what a pastor is supposed to do, you know what I mean, you can't, um, and it's the same thing with, with parenting, um, you know, y- y- you can't be a dictator over your kids and, and, you know, beat them up all, you know what I mean, you can't ride them raw, but at the same time, there does have to be order and, 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 and rules and that kind of stuff for kids, you know what I mean, there, there's that level of balance where um, mercy is necessary, but so is justice, it's, it's something that, that we see it as two things that are so completely divorced, but they're not. Um, and then we talked about um, the way that discipline is both personal. It's something that I discipline myself. I, um, you know, like I fast. I, I would withhold myself from some things that are pleasurable. Like for instance, pornography is pleasurable, and yet we can't do it. See what I mean? We, we hold ourselves to a discipline. And then we talked about congregational. How um, in the body there is supposed to be um, correction. There's supposed to be um, um, growth. And remember. Having an unteachable spirit means that you're not a disciple of Christ. If you can't be told what to do spiritually, you can't be, you know, you're not going to take orders from anyone. That's called an unteachable spirit. That means you're hardening your heart. You, you can't listen to anybody. Which, what's going to happen is the enemy is going to plant seeds in your heart, and you're going to become a very bitter person. Um, and it just kind of grows and grows without anything combating that since you've removed yourself from the authority over your life. And we'll talk about that later on. Um, but definitely is a thing that, that needs to be um, needs to be an ongoing thing within the church. So that takes us to this week. Mm-hmm. What is addiction? How does it work? 
Did you guys get any time to think about this over the past two weeks? So, like, what, what type of addiction? Oh, anything that, that, that you have, that, that you, um, really anything. You know what I mean? So, like, use the, that the addiction as an example? Yeah, sure. Keep knocking at the devil's door, you can't get an answer. <laughs> that's, that's what I learned from uh, uh, being an ex drug user. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, that's, uh, I know a lot about that. <laughs> I know a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Addiction will get all of you quick. Yeah. You don't know it. Yeah. No. There's so many things that I'm having to hold my tongue about. Okay. <laughs> Right, sorry, um, because we're going to talk about it later, and if I talk about it now, I'll throw away the, the climax of the lesson. Ah, okay, anybody else? <laughs> Addiction is when you, uh, is a dependency, it's, and, and it can be either mo- emotional or physical or both. Mm-hmm. On, well, there's a lot of things. You can be addicted to a substance, to an activity. I mean... There's actually pretty much anything you do in your life can become an addiction. Mm. So, you, you guys want to add anything? Nicole, you're being awful quiet over there. Nothing? Okay. Grace, I still see you. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to throw anything in? Throw any ideas out there? Isaiah, Serena, you guys got anything else? Something you do every day when you wake up. Yeah. Like, uh, video games. Mm-hmm. It's like you sit home and do that and nothing else. You don't go outside yeah. and, and. How did you know? Enough, you'll, just, <laughs> you'll just, like, keep doing that. And I heard about this one guy. He killed himself because he uh, lost all of his. Uh, things that his achievements online. His trophies? Something. Oh man. <laughs> I don't know, something I read about. Yeah, but he, he liked himself because he got so mad. Oh my god. Jeez, that's a little intense. <laughs> yeah. <That is> major <laughs> addiction. <right laughs> well. <Wow. laughs> and if you looked at the guy, you would be like, well, uh, it, it, it tells you more about him. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a big guy. Uh, I don't remember much, but I know the fact that yeah, he did that over a video game. I mean, that, uh, he must have been there, down there in his basement or wherever, 40 years, <laughs> and then got tired of it. <laughs> you know, at the Oasis, we've got some kids that throw a fit if you blow up their house on Minecraft. Oh I mean, holy gosh. crap. Huh? <laughs> you, one of these days, I'm just waiting for one of them to bring a knife and just start stabbing. I, I huh. swear, there's been some of them break down crying because no, but seriously. their house is... Oh, I know. I experienced this in my own house. I had to literally move one kid off the station into the other room and while this kid was like crying about this. I, was, I had to bring peace to the situation. He was really upset. But he was like 10, yeah. so... Serious. <laughs> serious business. So, um, does anybody have a... Um, encounter with addiction in yourself or in somebody else that you would want to talk about, want to share? share. Okay. You Is there anything, right anything specific? Yeah. Anything specific? Well. About dealing, about dealing with someone with addiction or about dealing with addiction? Well, <laughs> I've had to do both, um, obviously. I was raised um, in a house where my dad was a drug addict and an alcoholic, and you know, it ended up taking his life, and then I got older and started getting into drugs, and then I developed an addiction to drugs, and then I met my boyfriend who became my husband who had an addiction to drugs, and honestly, addiction, drug addiction, alcohol addiction has been a part of my life, my whole life. So, it's an ugly thing. Um, and addiction is one of those things that if you don't, if you don't truly 
get over addiction, you're just gonna tr you're just gonna trade one addiction for another. Yeah. Transference, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. No. You have to deal with that one addiction, and you have to overcome it, and you know you have to find other outlets, you know, to yeah. provide yourself security and comfort. Yeah. Outside of, of, of drugs or, or really anything, you know, shop, internet shopping can be an addiction, you know. Oh yeah, it can. <laughs> um, and, and it's a, and it's a way <laughs> of comforting yourself. You know, well, yeah. believe it or not, people don't think that, but it, it really is. You know, oh, I feel like crap. I'm gonna go buy myself a new shirt to make myself yeah. feel better. It's really it's an insecurity thing too. A lot of it is insecurities. You know that we don't feel like we're good enough. Mm. And it depresses us, gets us down, and so we have to do things that make us feel a certain yeah. way. And um, unfortunately, drugs is the ugliest form of addiction, and well, pornography is, is pretty bad too, because it just totally alters our way of thinking and skews yeah. our view of the world, you know, yeah. and everybody in our lives and everybody around us, you know. Yeah. Um, I went through several years of separation from my own family because. I started to just hate them, mm. but I didn't really hate them. I hated, I hated myself, you know. But um, God is the only thing that you know. Uh, Chuck Pastor and I were talking about um, this thing with the um, with demonic uh, possession, and one of the things that he brought up is that um, oftentimes, like especially with like spiritual kind of things. Um, it's not the demon or whatever that that's the issue. It's 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 the person's heart or their attitude. And I think that uh, why well, I mentioned that is because what Serena said about um, uh, about you know transferring from one addiction to another, um, where you're not really addressing the problem in your heart. Um, you know, and I think that it kind of goes hand in hand with that same thing. Is we we want to try and like um, perfect our outside and, and 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 make ourselves look better. So you know what I mean. We want to we want to have that. Um, that feeling of accomplishment in our outside and everything, but then we don't actually want to change the inside. Um, yeah, but I'm sorry. Any anybody else have anything else to say, or did you have anything else to well, say? Well, that that's a very good point because when I decided that I wanted to change my life, I felt like I couldn't. So instead, I just started hiding. Mm. You know the things that I was doing. You know, yeah. I started hiding, doing drugs and. Yeah. You know, because I had been off of drugs for a while, but then I got back into drugs and alcohol for a little bit, and uh, and and really tried to hide that. So just that way, everybody thought that I was good and I had I had overcome it. Yeah. But really, I was secretly battling it yeah. now at this point. But there's a comes a time where it starts coming through, and people start to notice yeah. that you're not, you know, you're not doing good and. And then when people start pointing it out, <laughs> it's rough. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I'm going to tell you a little bit of something about me. Wow. Yeah, I, I struggle with drug use. I've, I've been sober for like off hard drugs for since my surgery. Uh huh. On my head. For those of you who haven't seen my head or anything like that. I'll, sh I'll have to show you guys one day or one phone had pictures um, I don't know you know I feel like I'm away from it but then again I'm not because I need other drugs to treat my nerve damage like uh, Xanax yeah. I have that prescribed to me I take that there's sometimes I can't even walk across the street. Yeah. I have to turn back around and go in, in the house. Yeah. And then sit down and whatever. And then, and then I'm getting a, a medical cannabis card for my brain. Because uh, sometimes the nerves in my brain and the, so it, I'm feeling that kind of like little pains. I can, you know, sometimes I don't know what it is but yeah I like I feel like I'm away from it, but I know I know myself. Once I let something go too far, yeah, you know. I, I take it too far. Yeah. You know. So like I feel like I'm sober, but then again I'm not. Yeah. You know. So I don't know. 
And then, like, this is something I don't really talk about, but I'll share this with you guys. I'm sure you guys know what uh, schizophrenia is. Yeah. Okay, well, I have that. There's, there's different types of it. There's, uh, in fact, this one I, I know it. It's called uh, schizoaffective. Huh? Uh, you can look it up, read it if you guys are curious about it, but I don't deal with that. Yeah, it's just drugs will pollute your mind yeah. and ruin your mind, and I I live with that every day. And I wake up, I think about what I could have done differently. That, mm. You know, when I started doing it, yeah. I started doing it. I think about thirteen or fourteen, but it went like in a fast way. Yeah, and I happen to have head surgery because of that, putting things up my nose, and all kinds of other ways you can think about you. Know. What, what's your name? Which one? Serena? Yeah, Serena. Yes. Uh, that's why I said that, because I'm not, now I feel like you can relate to what I'm, what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like, I literally wake, wake up, and then... I want to sit down and enjoy my day, but then I have to fight for that. Yeah. I have to fight for my, uh, what do you call it, um, what I want to do. Yeah. And then I got voices and things, you know, hallucinations that, that are there. And then, I don't know, I just feel like I'm being haunted yeah. by things. Yeah. I'm not sure what it is, but I I know enough to get out of it and deal with it because I've been through enough misery to not want to go back there again because if I do, I'll probably guys be seeing the funeral or spread my ashes, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really that's really good that you are. Uh you know that and because a lot of people don't you know they don't ever get that and um like my dad he he he, he killed himself he, he died his addiction was just it was too much for him and so he never overcame addiction and some people don't and that's why that's where the hope of jesus comes in is knowing that you can't change yourself and that's almost that's almost a, a relieving thing. That's almost a relief, knowing that mm -hmm. you can't change yourself and that you don't have to. Like, of course, you have to make steps and you have to be obedient to God, but, you know, you just give yourself to God and you just let Him take care of you. And because we can't fix other people and we really can't even fix ourselves without God's help. So. Yeah. Because <laughs> once I go over and try my ways, I just keep digging deeper and my heart my heart hardens yeah. and then it feels like uh, I've literally felt nothing before and it scares me not because I feel things that yeah. you know, like my wife she she's a big part of it for me uh, getting better mm -hmm. nobody wanted to deal with me you know because I was a high head and that means I got a bad temper yeah. I don't go off like I used to. You know, I've, I've grown up a lot. And I realize drugs will keep me at that level. Yeah. If I, you know, if I continue to do this. Yeah. And things I can see myself, you know, I don't want to end up in a, in a pen. Or, yeah. You know, or, you know, I've been to jail, but I haven't been to prison. I feel that's next. <laughs> you know, for doing whatever reason. No. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you guys for sharing. So, um, just a few different things I want to look at. Sorry, this is a little bit of an, a blurry image. I couldn't find a better version of it. Um, here are just some. It's just a breakdown of risk factors. There, there's the whole gene aspect of it. Genetics, gender, mental disorders, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, for instance, if your parent struggles with something, there's a higher chance that you're going to struggle with it, that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's the environment here. 
Uh, chaotic home and abuse, parents' use and attitudes, peer influences. That would be like um, if a friend talks you into doing something. Uh, community attitudes. Um, you know, is your community a, a, a mostly like, you know, a, we don't allow drugs here, or is it more of like a, you know, this is an acceptable kind of thing? Um, poor school achievement. Um, a lot of times when people don't feel like they're smart, uh, they will compensate with something that they feel is, it, it may, either makes them feel, feel other things that they're not used to, or overcompensates for that, makes them part of the in crowd or whatever. Um, a lot of people just have different reasons, so to say all the reasons is just futile. Um, and then there's the actual drug here. Router, uh, route of administration, effective drug itself, early use, availability, cost, all those things factor in. And then depending on who you are and what, when, which drug it is, with all those factors, it leads to addiction. So for different people, obviously the drug's going to be different, um, which is going to affect their brain mechanisms differently. And depending on the different genes, they'll be more, uh, let's say, prone to a certain kind of addiction over another kind of addiction. For instance, some people will try alcohol and they're fine. Like, whatever. They don't, they don't ever, it doesn't ever go anywhere. More than other people, um, for instance, the Bohr family, Bohrs and, and alcohol do not mix, like... We cannot hold our liquor. If we, if we get, once we have a drink, we'll always have another drink. Um, that's just kind of the, the, the thing that marks the Bohr family. My grandpa was a drunk. My dad was a drunk. My brother was a drunk. So, I mean, like, it, it's just some things that, that, that... Were you going to say something? Oh, there's just some things that, you know, it just, once again, goes back to the, bio, to the genes, the environment, just the witch drug, the brain mechanisms. It all just kind of adds up together. Um, but then there's a progression of drug and alcohol use which I know this may sound really, really confusing, but it's actually not. Basically, it's just that there are steps that lead to a full-on addiction. Um, there's no use here, which obviously means no addiction. But then there's uh, experimentation that, oh, well, you just want to try it or whatever, right? But then there's a regular use. This, isn't, this is different than addiction because you are, you can, you're still at a point where you can technically stop and it's not, there's not going to be that many um, side effects. Like if it's a drug, for instance, you can stop and you won't have that much withdrawal. It'll, you know, it's, you're not using it that much. Um, alcohol, you might have a hangover, but you can still uh, bounce back. This is a very small window, however. Um, once you hit um, right after experimentation where you felt like the first thing, um, if it's the drug that really suits your body, it'll very rapidly descend to, to uh, addiction. Um, but then there's the regular use. Now abuse. The thing that can separates regular use from abuse is abuse is an overuse, whereas regular use is like, let's say drinking once a day. That would be regular use. But then abuse would be over drinking once a day. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like just um, t multiplying it. Does that make sense? Um, obviously, Serena and Isaiah, I don't have to explain these things to you guys. Uh, does that make sense to you guys? <laughs> um, so then there's, uh, then there's dependency. This is this these and these kind of go right hand in hand. Um, once you reach the play the 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 space of regular use, it's very quickly going to go to abuse, then to dependency where you literally cannot stop, and then to addiction where it's like can't stop on multiplying that. You know what I mean? It's like the um, the next step of that. I don't know how to say that. The um, hyperdrive, I guess. Um, so then leads to the cycle of addiction. Um, which you can see just kind of goes around in circles. You have the abstinence. You know, you, you try to go without it. But then there'll be a trigger, something that sets you off, something that reminds you of it, whatever. Maybe maybe whatever it was was a routine of your day. Uh, like, for instance, every day that you got up, like in the mornings you did something, or before you went to sleep you did something, or whatever. Um, or whenever you did it, you, you did it at a certain place or at a certain time or whatever. Um, and that's your trigger. And sometimes, for some people, it's even like weather conditions. Where a trigger really is individual to the to the specific person. There, there's just because one one person has a trigger doesn't mean somebody else will. Um, which then leads immediately into the tempting thoughts. This is where you start actually um, visualizing, actually start thinking about it. You, you can't change your change your mind from 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 what it's what it's focusing on. It gets over um, over analyzes what you're thinking about. Which leads to the SUD, that's in psycho um, psychology. psychology, yeah, I think it's psychology, and um, that's basically the, the pain scale. Ten is you cannot go without it. One is you're okay. So um, obviously the sud scale, it's going to start, you know, let's say for this person, it's going to start on three, but then it's going to grow and grow the harder, the longer they go with abstinence. Um, and then there's the indulgence, which is immediately followed by the defeated thoughts, where, you know, um, you're a victim or whatever, you know, the guilt, the shame, the, the, the stuff that just kind of replays in your head, maybe if I would have tried harder, that kind of stuff, 
um, which then obviously is connected right hand in hand with guilt, um, where the person very usually in a, in a cycle of addiction, the person will have a very low view of themselves, um, especially um, it. Well, there, there's two things. If, like, okay, let me think of how I'm trying to say this. If the person has been off the drug for a substantial amount of time, months, years, etc., um, they they go through this process of thinking where they realize that they're off, and then they go into n another level of guilt. Like, oh, I've wa like Isaiah talked about this. Oh, I've wasted this time, or I've made made too many mistakes, or whatever. But then there's also a level of guilt in the cycle of addiction itself, where the person will will partake of it, and then they'll they'll feel bad about it. So then they'll say, okay, I'm going to try harder not to do it this time, and then they'll repeat it again, so they'll feel mil more guilty that they felt again. Um, so there's really kind of different layers of guilt and they kind of go in hand in hand. Now, it's why I bring this up is because as Christians we need to make sure that when we are helping people, we're not guilt-tripping people. In, in a generation ago, it was synonymous, one and the same. If you were helping someone, it meant you needed to tell them what, what the Holy Spirit needed to do in their heart or else they would never have learned and, and then the blood would have been on your hands. Well, that's not actually what the Bible says. That's, that's twisting what the Bible says. We are not called to manipulate people. We're not called to guilt trip people. And we are not called to lord it over people. Okay? Um, in fact, one of the things that I want you to see from tonight's lesson is that addiction is something that isn't just drugs. Everybody, and Serena already hinted at this, so I'm just if you were paying attention to what Serena said, you know what I'm about to say. Um, everybody is going to struggle with an addiction of some sort in the process of their life. Uh, be it, you know, trying to find... Um, uh, what is the one you said? Uh, insecurity, trying to find, um, doing different things that make you feel like you belong. And that can be drugs, it can be sexual, it can be, you know, uh, it can be, she brought up the thing about spending. I mean, just great examples um, where um, it's not just, you know, because what we do is we, we confine it to the drug addict. This person dr does drugs, I've never even touched drugs. I'm so much better than them. But the truth is that it's the, heart, it's the attitude of the heart, regardless of whether it's displayed or manifested in drugs, or in sex, or in, see what I mean, insecurity, whatever that thing is, it's going to be something where it's a defeatist mentality that, that, that definitely get, does get over on you. And uh, anything that really is going to involve the cycle of addiction, I mean, it, it is an addiction. Um, and, and we'll see about that in a second. She brought up the thing about emotional and physical um, pain, uh, I mean, not pain, um, dependency. dependency. We'll look at that in just a second, but first kind of get an idea of this. And then after guilt is the penance. You know, I'll never do that again. Um, I'm going to try harder. Um, I, I can do it this time. You know, whatever. And then which leads to the abstinence period, which then is fine until the trigger happens again and it all repeats itself. Um, so just to kind of recap here, we talked about the risk factors. Okay. And then there are some drugs that are more at risk than other drugs. For instance, cocaine is going to be way more addictive than, let's say, marijuana. See what I mean? Um, and then obviously, it, it, once again, it, de it depends on you specifically, but still there are some drugs that, that, that are going to be very, very, very uh, addictive regardless of whether, um, whatever, your, whatever the risk factors are. Um, and then we talked about the way that the, the drugs progress. Really, the ideal is to not even experiment, and that will prevent you from the, from the, rest, of the rest of the thing. That's the ideal, but obviously... Um, um, ideals are, are, are very rarely met. That's why they're called the ideal. Um, and then we talked about the cycle of addiction. Any questions on any of that before we kind of build on this? Okay. Uh, because if you don't understand this stuff, it's probably not going to understand the rest of it. Um, so then there's a, a cycle of addiction long term, though. Okay. Now this one gets a little bit more complicated. Try to remember this, which is kind of like a, a short-term cycle of addiction, something that happens. This can happen... This whole cycle can take place within the span of hours, days, weeks. Once again, it depends what the thing is and who the person is. Okay. But then there's the long-term cycle of addiction, which I think might have been what Isaiah was talking about, um, where it feels like you haven't quite gotten over it. Um, I kind of want to steal the idea that he said and kind of build on that. First is, a, um, well, we, you can really start anywhere. Um, so we'll start with craving. When someone sees something that reminds them of their addiction, they receive cravings for it because of their memories of it. Now, once again, though, if you've never done it, there's not going to be a memory factor, so that's going to be a lot different. Or if you've only done it once or twice, it's going to be a little bit different than if you have a lifestyle of doing it. Okay. Also, um, if, you, if your first um, experience of doing it was a pleasurable one, 
your mind is going to tell you that the thing itself was pleasurable, and so you're going to keep doing it to to um, receive that same satisfaction that you did the first time. But it's not going to work because then all the factors aren't going to ever add up again, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, so then, after you've done it, after you've done it, that leads you to something called tolerance. Basically, your body builds up the more you do something, where it takes more of something in order to get a high from that something. For instance, if you look at pornography frequently, you're going to have to look at more pornography, newer pornography, see what I mean? And it's kind of getting, again, if you're married, it's going to get into your marriage. You're not going to find your spouse very, very pleasing or whatever. Um, and it kind of spreads out the different things. So if that's not even a drug, you can imagine how it is for drugs. Um, so um, addictive drugs such as cocaine wipe out uh, dopamine receptors, which I want you to understand that it actually does mess with the way your body functions. Um, as you, as I just read there, it, it, it wipes out your dopamine receptors, which means that your brain isn't going to be functioning on the same level it was before you did the drugs, which means you're going to need more drugs in order to compensate for the loss of receptors, which means that you, you're going to have to compensate more because you're going to lose more receptors. You know what I mean? The more you do it, the, the more it's going to mess with your brain um, on an actual physical level. We're not even talking about spiritually. We're talking about physical. Your body can um, actually stop producing the chemicals it's supposed to be producing. Yeah. And then for the rest of your life, you will have to be on a medication yes. that will cause those chemical that will put yeah. those chemicals in your body because your body will no longer produce them on their own. Yeah. Which can cause a, a lot of people... Um, were you going to say something? Yeah, like dopamine. Like, like it's naturally produced like if you like work out. Mm -hmm. You feel it in your brain. Yeah, I, look, like, I don't really feel... Yeah. Something going on in my brain. And sometimes I, like, oh, screw it. I have a, uh, what do you call it? Like, uh, a substitute. Uh-huh. Like, oh, I won't, I won't do an Adderall today, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, drink a Monster instead. Yeah. Like, that's why I set my thought up. Yeah. Um, and like Isaiah has said, has said here, I want you guys to remember that um, the numbness that comes with it. Okay, I want you guys to remember that um, because a lot of times you'll, you'll be dealing with a drug addict, and you'll you'll be like, well, geez, what's wrong with this guy? And there actually might be something wrong with them. Like you know what I mean? Like drugs are, are, are once again they're they're a consuming thing. Um, we think when we've never done drugs before, we think a certain way. Like oh, you could stop if you wanted to, or um, it's not that bad, or why don't they just snap out of it? But then when you've actually done the thing, it's like, oh, this is not what I was thinking about at all. See, it's a lot easier to play Christian and to play righteousness when you don't actually know what the person's going through, you know what I mean? Um, so, uh, going with, with, with um, oh, what, Sunni, you said something. What, what were you talking about when you, the last time you just spoke? Right before Isaiah. That your body will actually stop producing these chemicals. Yes, that. Um, and so a lot of times, you have to... Um, you have to see a doctor afterwards uh, to get your body the, to, 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 to take certain things to get your body to function. Um, obviously, it won't be at the exact same level, but at a higher level than it currently is. See what I mean? Um, and, and a lot of times, you'll see people develop sleeping problems because of this or um, uh, problems that eventually, because of the different things going on in their brain, will transfer over to their, like relationships and different things like that where it'll literally be like... Um, I'm going to use this word because Isaiah talked about being haunted. It, um, in a different context, it is like the drug will still follow after you, even after you um, haven't been taking it. Um, it is something that definitely does change your entire life. Uh, and so the addict has to use more and more of the drug each time to get the same high. Um, so then after the tolerance, there's going to be a level where, hopefully, where somebody says, okay, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to stop this for real now. And th then they'll then eventually go through a phase of withdrawal. When someone is trying to refrain from giving in to their addiction, they may feel the physical and psychological loss of it, feelings of misery, pain, nausea, etc. Um, there, but I want to kind of caution on this: if you're taking certain drugs, it's not wise to just stop cold turkey because you can actually kill yourself. Mm -hmm. So once again, there's things like rehab that will help you go on lesser medication or, uh, drugs until you're off. There's things you can do besides just stopping cold turkey. There's some things that you can stop cold turkey. It doesn't matter. Like, for instance, if you smoke a lot of pot and you stop, who cares? Nothing's going to happen. Or cigarettes. Yeah, nothing's going to happen. You're fine. 
uh, if you st- uh, try, uh, well, I- I'm I'm used to having sex all the time, so I'm gonna stop having sex. Nothing's gonna happen. They scientists have proven nothing's gonna happen by getting blue balls. Nothing happens from that. Okay, it's okay. You're gonna get through this. But then there's other things that actually will lead to, um, to very very bad things. Um, obviously, if someone's um, an alcoholic and they just all of a sudden stop, they're gonna go through things like nausea. It's gonna, it's gonna happen. It does go away. You can't get through it. It's gonna be painful, but you can do it. Um, and another thing that happens with withdrawal is the different things um, uh, psychologically that you were running from or were, were masking with the drug will tend to surface during the same time that you're having the pain. And as even as the pain subsides, the thoughts grow worse and worse. Where the person is going through withdrawals, even if they're physically through the withdrawals, mentally they will still be in a place of guilt, um, uh, disaster, uh, a fear. Uh, you know, all these different things. So keep that in mind, too. Major anxiety. Major anxiety. <laughs> um, and then there's the relapse. Now, once again, ideally, hopefully, people can get out of this. But the cycle of addiction in long-term people usually follows this method when they do relapse. I'm not trying to speak like despair over people. I'm not trying to say stuff like that. But when it does happen, this is what it looks like. Um, then they hit the relapse again. Now, obviously, especially if, if the person has been going good for, for months or years, um, they're going to be extremely, extremely guilt-ridden, which means what do you not do when you're dealing with them? You do not guilt-trip them. <laughs> good, we're learning. Because, once again, after the relapse, they're already in that place of um, uh, just depression. So, uh, relapse. When addicts see something that makes them remember their addiction, these cues um, these cues turn on drug related memories, and addicts respond by giving into their addiction. Um, now, it has been said by many addicts, it's just a matter of time. It's how long you can stand before you fall, but that's not true. There is a life after addiction. You can get through it. Um, however, uh, I just want you guys to understand the cycle there, so you can more understand of what a drug addict goes through. Like some of you guys aren't gonna have that hard of a time because you've either had family members or you've gone through it, but then there's other people who have never actually um, had one-on-one contact, so this is good. Um, this, I couldn't find a chart of this, so I had to make my own. I hope you guys appreciate my artwork. Um, <laughs> here is the pleasure pain scale, okay? And this in the middle is, is, is this is just, everything's good. It's not, not pleasurable, not painful. It's just okay, okay? Now, something happens um, that pushes someone into the pain factor. This could be... Um, death of a relative. It could be um, feeling like an outcast. It could be a number of different things. So then they seek an escape, which takes them to this high of pleasure. It's, it can be whatever, drugs, porn, sex, food, it doesn't matter. Okay, This is whatever their, their escape is that, that they find comfort in. It's going to take them up here to this pleasure. But then when they come off the high, it's going to take them below how bad they were actually feeling in the first place. Okay. Mm-hmm a new level of pain which includes shame and guilt. Now if you notice, that's quite a drop there. Okay, So then comes the cycle that we talked about. There's the cooling period where where, you know you you try to go without for a little while, there's the commitments, I'll never do it again, there's a withdrawal period, there's the trigger period, and then eventually the repeated behavior, which they do the escape again but they get less of a high. Now after, after, pretty quickly, on here there's only two markers, but you have to think long term. Um, this is just a chart. So uh, after some time, it doesn't have to be two times, it can be once, twice, 20 times, whatever, they reach a place where even when they do it, they no longer reach up to the same level that they were when they first experienced the pain. This is when, ad- when addiction becomes especially um, especially difficult to get someone out of because they live their whole life in the period of pain. But between the, the shame and the guilt period, the escape is still in the pain structure spectrum they, they just go through the, these whole cycles and it's in the pain thing and the, the pain part of it so it just kind of repeats and repeats and gets worse and worse and the thing that makes it all even worse is if that's not bad enough is this right here at the, at the top change in thoughts the longer someone is in an addictive uh, pattern the more their thought processes will actually change they'll start viewing the world differently remember we were talking about world views earlier this is what I was building towards um, drug addicts will have a different world view um, like, for instance, you, you go talk to people in, which one's long-term, jail or prison? Prison. 
Prison. Prison. You talk to people in prison, and they're they're going to talk about the way that you know everybody's wronged them, and they, they're not going to they're not going to take responsibility for their actions. Um, there are some, but I mean, by and large, there's this prison mentality, you know, where you, the world has wronged you, and you know it's everybody else's fault. You know what I mean? It's just a, this idea, and it's the same thing with with drug addicts. There's this there's this change that happens in the, in their worldview, and to make things even worse, as if I haven't ruined your day enough. When somebody gets on a on an addictive um, into addictive behavior when they're a younger age, you'll see the same immature patterns repeat themselves, especially so when they get off the drug, because there'll be a conflict between the old druggie and the person they were when they were twelve or whatever before they got onto the drug. See what I mean? So you're gonna have forty year old <sighs> men who still act like teenagers. See, I mean, they haven't learned to take responsibility for themselves. They haven't learned how to conduct their life because the the drug has literally, I'm using this by the dictionary definition, has retarded their... Re, retard, retardated? Retarded? I don't know. Um, has affected their mental growth, right. which obviously is going to affect their spiritual growth and all these different things too. So a lot of times you'll be talking with people and you're like, does this person have no common sense? Well, actually, they might not have common sense. Do you know what I mean? Right. If someone's on a drug long enough, not only are they deterior deteriorating, but they're not going to reach new levels of maturity while the drug is holding them down. Do you know what I mean? So then when they get off the drug, you expect for them to act all different, and they're not. They're still going to act like that, that, that teenager that, that they were before. Do you know what I mean? Because they need to do maturing. That's what, what Isaiah was talking about, too. There's that, there's that level of maturity that comes when you get off and you start realizing, oh, when you start thinking differently. And remember... Just because someone's been off drugs for even a couple of years doesn't mean that the mentality is still gone. Which means you need to be very, very careful to encourage people. Which, I mean, that's just a good idea even if somebody hasn't been on drugs. You still should focus on encouraging people. There's enough negativity in the world without us adding to it. You know, just help people to feel better. You know what I mean? Like the Bible says, be a peacemaker. Be someone who actually goes into situations that are troubling, and, and what can you do to relieve the pain? What can you do to change somebody's life? So, um, does everybody understand that? The way that the, the thought process changes at the same level that it gets worse and worse and worse? Yeah. Okay. Any questions on any of those charts that I showed? Do you guys need to see anything else over again? Okay. We're not going to go real, um, oops, sorry, real long on this, but um, then there's this. In addictions, there's a growing, there, there are growing levels of addiction. And what this means is that the longer that someone is on an addiction, the more it takes root in their life. Okay? First is emotional, okay? um, which is more of, and, and I'll, I'll, there's this link right here that I'll, that I'll show you guys if you guys really want to learn more about it, but it's more of um, needing something on an emotional level. It's not so much, um, I mean, it's still a big deal, but because um, you're, you're trying to satisfy an inward need, by either doing something or whatever. Um, so it is still a big deal, but it's not the full-on hardcore physical addiction, physical de dependency, okay? So then after emotion is a mental uh, um, a, uh, dependency. And the thing about mental uh, dependencies that I noticed is that it's kind of an awkward place for the addict because they're emotionally tied to it, but they're not quite at the place of physical dependency, but yet they still think that they are. Have you guys, do you guys know what a placebo is mm -hmm. it's where somebody gives someone a, me a medication that actually isn't a medication it's like basically a sugar pill and it they think that it's doing something for them so they act differently you know what i mean right. it's kind of like that kind of that's a very very rough comparison but it's good enough for the for this um it's kind of it's, it's kind of like that and, and and the person will genuinely believe themselves to be in a darker place than what they actually are which is going to resurface after they get off the addiction. They're still going to think that they're in a dark place. Um, and you really have to watch out for this. Because if someone believes themselves to be in a dark place, relapse is more imminent. You know what I mean? So if you can do anything to help that person draw out from that dark place, that'd be fantastic. Either spend time with them, distract them from it, um, anything. Just do something. Um, I mean... I don't want to sound like a cop out, but honestly, prayer does do things. Okay, so if you know somebody who's going, who's in a dark place like that, pray for them. And I'm I'm gonna broaden this broaden this out um, because of something that we were talking about. Even if it's something like um, depression, 
I know that, you know, oh, that's not an addiction, but still, if, if you know somebody who struggles with addiction, call in and check up on them, you know, uh, pray for them, make sure that, that, that people with, with things like this, one minute they'll be fine, and a second later they'll be, they'll, they won't be, you know what I mean, and we need to be on our guard with this kind of stuff, because it only takes one second for them, for, for a relapse, it only takes that, that, you know what I mean? Uh, be it in depression or in drugs or anything, it only takes that one second, and uh, it's hard to to do that. But I I, I want to encourage everybody here. If you know somebody who relapsed, regardless of whether it resulted in death or not, it is not your fault. Okay, and the reason why I want to mention that is because sometimes sometimes we take it really seriously. Um, against us and and it's not your fault for so long I always thought that Sam was my fault and Sometimes you just need to know it's not it's not your fault. You do what you can, you pray for them, you stand with them, but at the end of the day, it's still their responsibility and it's not your fault. It's they still need to make the choice for themselves. And until they do, there's not much you can do. I've known a lot of alcoholics who they think that they want to quit, they genuinely do, but they're not ready yet. They haven't made that commitment in themselves, and so they're going to relapse again, and it's going to be hard to deal with, but you have to just accept that that was a decision that they made and be ready for the next time, because you never know when the time is that they're actually going to be ready. And I know that that sounds hard, but I guarantee you it's going to be harder to guilt trip yourself like it's your fault every time. And then after the mental dependency comes the time of physical dependency. This is like what I was talking about with the drugs where they literally cannot stop. If they stop, they will die. They need to ease off of it. You see what I mean? And a lot of times people try to do this spiritualizing thing which annoys me to no end. Oh, you just haven't have to have enough faith. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. It's called quitting cold turkey. It's a terrible idea. Faith isn't going to save you. God has natural or processes and orders. He told us in 2 Corinthians, I, I'm giving you a comfort so you can go and comfort others. He told us in the Old Testament, hey, I'm setting you aside as a people, not as individuals. He never created us for a life of solitude. So with that, thinking that simply, oh, I'm just going to pray a simple, simple cookie-cutter prayer, and then I'm just going to believe in my heart, and then I won't have to take any drugs anymore. Sometimes God does that, but don't expect and demand that God does it every single time. What you need to do, seek the Lord, yes. But follow the proper protocol and go to the doctor when you need to. That's just a fact. Some people try to try to guilt trip you into thinking that you're not a good enough Christian if you go to the doctor. That's bullcrap. Science and religion are not separated. Okay? Do going to the doctor is part of seeking God. Okay? What matters is that your heart is not trusting in man but in God. That's what matters, yes. But the doctor was given the knowledge by God. Never forget that. So in addiction, it is not a weakness to seek help from a doctor. That is not a weakness. That is called intelligence. Sometimes people make things way too mystical in, in Christianity. It doesn't have to be that mystical. Um, so then with this, there's two things. Not all addictions are equal. Two people can, can struggle with the same drug and one get out of it easy, and the other one not. Not all addictions are equal. That's just how it is. Um, not only that, but like, let's say um, one person's addicted to this drug, and one person's addicted to this drug. This person, let's say this person's addicted to cocaine, but this person's addicted to alcohol. And let's say the guy who's on cocaine gets out relatively quickly, but that guy in alcohol can't. Not all addictions are equal. Um, different addictions work stronger on certain people, which brings me to my second point. Not all addicts are equal. There are some addicts themselves 
who are, um, first off, so used to failure that they can't even imagine success. But not only that, there are some addicts who are so hooked on the thing that it's not going to be an easy process. But here's something I want you to understand. Sometimes the process of growth is found through failure. Sometimes the only way that that alcoholic is going to find success is by failing in getting drunk a few more times. Now, I'm not encouraging people to get drunk. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is every time you fail or, or a loved one fails, don't think that that's the end. Help them get back up and keep going because there can be a better tomorrow if we fight the battle today. See what I mean? Sometimes we need to realize it long term. What we like to do is short term. They need to get out of it right now. Well, it's, I mean, as great as I would be, it's probably not going to happen. We need to deal with them in patience and love. We need to help help them to continue to get up on their feet. Because if we don't, they're going to eventually give up. See what I mean? They need people to encourage them and to lift them back up on their feet. That's, that's what people need. We were not created for solitude. Um, any questions on that? Because I, I want to make sure we're all completely clear about this and how that works. Okay? Um, right here um, is, a, is a nice little um, article. How the crap? There we go. Shift, not control. Got it. Really? Uh, it's probably just going to take a minute. Oh, it upload. It opened up on this page. Now, I'm going to give you guys a minute, a few minutes to look over this. Um, I'm going to use the, use the bathroom. I'm going to let you guys read this for about three to five minutes. See if there's anything on there that, that's interesting to you, any, any notes you want to take. Um, and then we'll continue with a question for um, next week. I will post this on the um, Facebook once I post the video, and I'll probably post it in the thing of the video itself if you guys want to want that for later. What I want you to write on your sheets, though, um, is something um, specifically for um, an addict after failure, um, be it you or someone else, is sometimes 
Well, I'm not sad. Uh, what I want you to write down is this. Um, how, how, how would I want to say that? You'll beat this eventually. Because when somebody fails with an addiction, they get this mentality, well, I told you the shame guilt process, that it's not going to happen, they're never going to overcome. And what you need to do is write this down somewhere where you can constantly see it and constantly be reminded of it. Or if it's a loved one where they can constantly be reminded of it, you'll get this. But I messed up again, I, you'll get this. You'll get it eventually. You'll get it. And sometimes that's all people need to hear is that, 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 that validation. Yes, you did mess up. But it's not the end. Just try again. See what I mean? Get, get back up and keep going. And it's not about, oh, I'll just try harder. Just try harder. That's the same defeatist mentality that, that got you there in the first place. It's about don't give up and keep trying. You know what I mean? Sometimes you need to know that, that, that there is an end to the battle. It just may not be today. You know what I mean? You have to be willing to get back up and get, get going again. And honestly, I would say over half the battle with addiction is the mentality that goes with addiction, not the addiction itself. Because once we lose in here, we lose. Joyce Meyer has a book called uh, Battlefield of the Mind. You know what I mean? It, it's that kind of a mentality. Once you lose up here, you might as well just give up. If you can... You know what, the, what they teach you in survival training... I took a few different survival training camp, uh, courses. I've done different survival campouts. And how you do it is this. Your mentality. You don't let yourself start thinking defeatist. You don't let yourself thinking that you're not going to get out alive. You, you don't let yourself start thinking that. You, you think, what's next? See what I mean? That's how you survive in a survival situation. You don't let yourself worry or fear or panic. You don't, you don't let that take, even take place. What's next? I gotta get a shelter up. I gotta do this. See what I mean? You start thinking about what's next. What, what's it's the exact same thing with an addict. So you messed up again. What's next? See what I mean? Get get yourself out of defeatist mentality. If you can control the thoughts, it's gonna be a heck of a lot a lot easier to overcome the addiction itself. Um, so just a few more things, and then we're gonna then we're gonna going to um, uh, quit for the night. Uh, we're not gonna quit on this question. Um, we're gonna fit and quit probably on the next question. Um, what are some factors that you guys can think of um, um, that lead to addiction? Just some different things that they can encourage addiction. Sorry, it's just an alarm. Go ahead. Yeah. To yourself or Yeah. Yeah. What is that what effect what is actually a factor in <laughs> Like, um Well like a, like what you just said, uh, uh abuse. That that's 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 a factor that can cause addiction. Because like okay. Those so like things do what? Factors is just another word for things. Yeah, things, yeah. Right. It can be either um a physical thing or a a, a mental thing or, you know, different things like that, yeah. Okay. But, yeah, I mean, you, you gave the right answer, though. Abuse is, it can, can be something that leads to addiction. When, the, when, when, when we feel pain, we don't like it, and our brain tells us, hey, this isn't very fun. So we do things to cover up that, hey, this doesn't feel very fun feeling. Yeah. So. Any other ideas, guys? with him obviously abuse um, if we get into um, start getting into unhealthy relationships mm, yeah that's not just not just not parent just family yeah um, outside relationships yeah. I know that um, well there was a few factors for me was for one I think being in that situation my whole life um, you know being around you know, several family members that had addictions and just it being kind of a normal part of the day. Yeah. But um, I think what really, really majorly contributed was um, was bad relationships mm. outside of family. Yeah. Like, you know, abusive boyfriends and things like that. Yeah. 
um, boyfriends that did drugs and, and, and you know that was a big thing so. mm. I think outside relationships insecurity is a big thing especially for younger people mm, yeah because they're insecure and especially high school age too I don't know how many times I've heard that somebody was doing drugs because they it they were shy and it made them open yeah. up you yeah. know it made them be the person that they wanted to be that yeah. they felt like they couldn't be on their own yeah. and that's that's really big with like like you said with teenagers with younger and it gets younger and younger all the time yeah. you know? there's just like so much more pressure on kids to to be a certain way so I mean there's just there's there's a lot of factors I yeah. think yeah, I, yeah. That pretty much explains everything. <laughs> um, one thing we talked about a few weeks ago, if you guys remember, was we talked about um, hidden messages. Do you guys remember that? Oh, yeah. um, and so I think one of the things that can be a fa- factor to addiction is simply marketing. Um, you know, like for instance, alcohol commercials. How happy do those guys look? I mean, goodness nice. sakes. They, they've got the hottest chicks, they've got the nicest boats, they've got, you know... They're on a beach on vacation right. all the time. Right, like it's a party all the time. Uh, but then, you know, you actually or drink a lot and you don't have any money. Right. <laughs> Do what? Or if you mind control somebody. They say if you were you have, you, uh, slinging some dope or whatever, people use you. Yeah. See what you do while you're high, and be like, yeah, I bet I can do get them to do it next time. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Kind of, I don't know. I just do that out there if it's off. No, yeah, that is that is that is a very good point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, buddy. Buddy, that that was that was a really good one. Um, abuse. Uh, Isaiah mentioned it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Isaiah mentioned that. Yeah. Um, peer pressure. Uh, Serena mentioned that one. Um, a lack of community or, or um, church affiliation. Um, it's uh, actually statistically children who are involved with church, not necessarily go to church, but are involved with church where they feel like they belong, they feel like it gives them something creative to do. Statistically, um, it drops their uh, chances of becoming addicted to different, um, different things. So that's cool. Um, it doesn't have to be just be church, though. It can be any kind of a club or um, anything where they feel like they belong. Sports, um, sports, sports, anything like that where they feel like it's it's them. Yeah. So um, that's why I put community slash church anywhere where they feel like there's that bond. Um, lack of education or specific instructions on drugs. A lot of times, simply telling people about drugs before they get onto them uh, will change out the um, the income outcome. Um, for instance, whenever there's a um, in school settings, whenever there's a, a uh, instructional thing on, um, you know, where they go in and, and explain about drugs, explain about what they do to your body and that kind of stuff, the, the after effects and everything, uh, show the signs of all that, um, a lot of times it will drop drug use in the school. Um, so, I mean, that is definitely um, something that, that is worth the investment. Um, Instead of just, don't do drugs. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, or like, how many, how many Christian parents have said this, don't look at, don't look at porn. Or don't have sex outside of marriage, because. Or what will happen? And then, and then there's always that cop out answer, you'll make Jesus sad. But there's a lot of other reasons why you shouldn't too. Like I'm not saying that's not a good reason. Obviously, if something's displeasing to God, we should be concerned about it. But there are other reasons too. <laughs> you know what I mean? I say like, that to Kyle a lot, but you know he's not quite at that level. So yeah, uh, make Jesus sad. That's, yeah, that's a that's a. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I wouldn't say that to Eli. Right. Um, but, yeah, and there's, like, the thing, well, you know, well, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, troubled families, statistically, um, people, uh, kids who grow up with Audi father figure in the house are 80% more likely to end up in jail or prison. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about good fathers. We're talking about a father. Yeah. So... That's pretty traumatizing for me as a father. <laughs> I'm a little scared. Um, but anyways, um, or if there's uh, troubled families, um, you know, our kids definitely do learn if we don't really love our spouses. I'm not talking about feelings here. I'm talking about service. Um, and, or if, uh, 
well, if we just do things behind our spouse's back, if, if uh, you know, so many different things. When there's trouble in the home, kids have, like, super radar. And as soon as there's trouble in the atmosphere, they just know. I don't know how. Like, they'll be in the other room playing video games, and I'm just like, what? What? Susan it's like, told me recently that Eli asked her, why don't you and Grandpa hug every day? <laughs> oh, oh, burn, old lady, burn. <laughs> and she goes, I didn't even realize that he noticed. Yeah. Well, he is he is entering that sexual prime of his life though. Supposed to hug every day. You know that? I know. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> we just were discussing Eli's on the already reached the. He's entered the stage of puberty. He's there. He's not even at the threshold anymore. He's crossed the threshold and he's on his way. <laughs> and I'm very scared. <laughs> Oh, buddy, can you imagine what his first girlfriend's going to be like? <laughs> oh, man, the fun we're going to have. Hey, he did have a, a girlfriend in kindergarten. No, I mean like an actual girlfriend, you know, one that you actually go on actual dates with. The mommy's going to be taking him, dropping him off. Yeah, buddy. Like Mom, in the parking lot. stop watching his kids. Ew. Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'd be like, Eli, wait till I close my eyes before you do that. Don't close your eyes while you drive. <laughs> Anyways. No, I'll be like, you know what kissing leads to, right? Syphilis. I mean, mono. I mean. <laughs> okay, so Eli, when you were a kid, we talked about cooties. Now, the secret that you need to know, they are real. <laughs> they are so real. <laughs> um, okay. So, I think the only thing I wanted to mention last before we close up for this week is, first off, addicts have changed behavior patterns. Okay, so when you're dealing with an addict, understand what I'm saying, you can't really take what they do or say to you personally. I, I don't want to use that word, um, but I can't think of a better word. You can't take it to heart when an addict says something while they're under the influence, because they're just, they're, they're, they're not them. They will right. say stuff that are Right, and and they'll do things that is just rude. I mean, I remember when sometimes when Sam was, I don't even know what he was on that time, but uh, he he stole some money from mom and dad. Like it's what it's what you do when you're on that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like you're not gonna be on cocaine and be all, yes, Gracie, can you make me a pot of tea? Like no, it's not gonna happen. The, the, there's 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 changed behavior patterns. It, they're they're not gonna be the same them. Okay, this is something you need to accept. Because um, some people try to have actual serious relationships with, like, let's say an alcoholic. Do you know how difficult it is to carry on this conversation with an alcoholic? Like, oh my gosh. The, or really anybody that's, you know, mind is now altered. Yeah. I can think of many troubling situations I've been in with Sam that <laughs> I just had to remove myself from. You know, I just had to leave. Myself. I remember this one I time. Dodge. I remember this one guy. That one time, this drunk came by the church, and he's talking about God knows what. And Joe used to be a cop, so he knows how to deal with drunks. And so he just keeps every time the guy gets on this, he just changes the conversation real gently and keep keep because with alcoholics, if you keep changing the conversation, you're good. Don't stay on a conversation long, like ten seconds. And so he keeps going like this, and 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 one time he stays on a conversation a little bit too long, so the guy goes back to the original thing. Just spurs him away from it. <laughs> it, was just, it was just funny watching him. Uh, anyways, um, and also the second thing here, so addicts had changed behaviors, and the second thing I wanted you guys to remember is that withdrawal causes mood swings. If somebody is off of something that they're usually on, expect them to be moody. Okay. Expect it. Okay? And don't take it to heart when they are. Okay? <laughs> um, a lot of times, oh my gosh, like, they just say and do really rude things. And so you just kind of have to expect it and plan for it. Um, and so the question for the for next week, why should I fight addiction or temptation? Because oftentimes, for those of you who have ever been addicted to anything, you kind of start losing the re you, you lose the plot. Like, okay, what's the point of all this? And so that's what, what the question of the week is: Why should I fight addiction or temptation? Why should I even try? Because if you don't, we'll make Jesus sad. <laughs> Keep in mind also that a lot of times when people are addicted to something, I mean, they may know in their heart, but they'll always say this. I can stop anytime I want. Oh, my gosh. 
<laughs> You've heard that one, huh? Uh, yes. Any questions of anything we talked about? No? Going once. So this is Leaving off for next yeah, for next week, yes. Yeah. Any further comments before I close it off? I have a comment. Go for it, before I turn it off. Well, we were talking about never telling anybody that, you know, why don't you just stop or, you know, making them feel guilty. And that's what I really appreciate about our pastor is that he always tells people, you may... They, you may you may fall you may make a mistake no. but keep going don't no. give up because you know nobody ever really told me that you know like nobody ever told me that you may fail you yeah. know and it's okay Jesus still loves you or anything like that and um, and you know most people most, most, most people, this this is a fact, will relapse. Yeah. At least once. Yeah. If not more. It doesn't mean that they're not going to overcome it. Yeah. But you do relapse. Yeah. Because when you're addicted, you can't just give something up. You, and, you'll yeah. work towards it, and you'll be doing real good for a few weeks, or months even. You, you will relapse. Yeah. It's just a part of the process. But... You know, nobody ever told me, you know, if you fall, get process. back up. It'll yeah. be okay. i talking about the guilt thing. Yeah. I was overcome with, with just guilt and, you know, as a mom at the time. And so I beat myself up about being the worst mom in the whole world. And At the time, you're, you're not a mom anymore. Well, no. I'm I just, mean, I'm just kidding. I <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm Grace. <laughs> Serena. Serena. Yeah. But, um, you with the face. Thanks. <laughs> and so that's just a really important thing that that I'm glad that you touched on, but that that really does need to yeah. be, you know, made clear to people is that yeah. we can't make people feel guilty, and we need to let them know that that's a very big reality yeah. of of addiction, and that it's okay that that they can still overcome it. That doesn't mean defeat. It yeah. does not mean forever. And that's why I had you guys write that down. You'll get this eventually. You'll get it eventually. Just don't give up. Isaiah, were you going to say something? Yeah. I don't know. I kind of got thrown out. I can't remember what I was going to say. Oh, okay. All right. Well, if you do, write it down and bring it for next wait, week. Wait, wait. John's coming back. Uh, who's uh, Sam? Uh, my brother, her husband. 